All right, we're gonna get started. I wanna thank everyone for being here. Welcome on this um, foggy, smoky, little bit gloomy Saturday, but I thank you beautiful people for being here. And I wanna welcome you to the unceded land of the Ohlone Ramutush people and acknowledge the many Ramutush Ohlone tribal groups and families as the rightful stewards of the lands on which we live and reside and work here in our Bay Area. Uh, we are committed and encourage you to learn more about Bay Area tribal communities and first person culture. Um, I put a link in our box and I'll, I'll put some more links as we go along and it'll have a lot of resources about uh, indigenous culture, first person, um, lots of great links that I encourage you to go check out. And we also want to acknowledge uh, Black Lives Matter at this time and the continued pain that our country keeps uh, persisting within and know that SFPL is not a neutral institution and we are working and striving to fix our own systemic racism and we stand in solidarity with Black Lives Matter. And also within that doc, I have provided a lot of book lists about Black Lives and um, reading lists and other resources. So that's all in the link and you can check that out later. I will also be sending you out a follow-up email after Will's discussion. And as Will is presenting today, I'll be taking some notes. If things come up, I'll add those to this document. And you can see all the great events flying by on the slideshow there. I just wanna quickly hit on a couple things. Um, we are now celebrating Viva Latino Heritage Month, and we go from now until November 2nd when it is Day of the Dead. We have some amazing lineup of programs. We will be honoring and celebrating Mr. Benjamin Boxiera, who has written um, this book, Barrio Bushido, but this is his first book, and he is now about to come out with his sequel to this book, Coroneta. And that comes out September 30th. And there he is in conversation with Luis Rodriguez. My mind is blown. It's a big check mark. I'm so happy to promote all these amazing people that I get to promote. And you can sign up for our newsletter, which is the best way to find out about things. And I will also put that in the box, but you can also just go to our webpage. And so Ben is part of our On the Same Page, which is a bi-monthly read we do at San Francisco, encouraging all of San Francisco to read the same book. We'll have two book clubs around this. And if you just saw by, Fly By with Chanel Miller, she is our One City, One Book for 2021. And so we're excited about that and that'll all be coming up. And then just our PSAs here. Um, definitely please tell everyone to tell everyone to take their census. It is so important. It is just mind boggling. So please make sure that happens. Super important. Also, please wear your masks when you go out. Now double more than ever. The smoke is terrible. Um, but please, you know, take care of our, our people who serve us daily out in the streets. Um, and we still do have uh, COVID testing happening. So you can go check that out at SF dot gov slash city test sf and i'm gonna stop my slideshow here and one last thing though of course is we always want to thank our friends of the san francisco public library who help sponsor all these amazing programs particularly campaigns like viva and one city one book um, so, and just some other things, we will be using the question and answer box today. Uh, will will be answering some questions at the end if time permits and use that. You can use the chat box and the Q&A is for Q&A. Um, and now I want to introduce you to today's speaker, Will Maynez. Will, you can go ahead and pull up your slideshow. And you're gonna also wanna start your video, Will. So today is Diego Rivera in San Francisco. And this is sort of an anticipation of Diego Rivera's America happening at SFMOMA. 
Will Maynez for over 23 years has researched and lectured on Diego Rivera's Pan American Unity Mural at City College. He is an expert, um, as well as uh, on many other Rivera's murals. He is the mural steward. He maintains the mural's website and composes its newsletter. He has written a one act interview with Frida and has just finished a play, Rhapsodia in Azul. My Spanish is terrible, right? An American in Mexico, or well, Rhapsody, Rhapsody in Blue, I love it. Um, about a 1935 Mexico City party for George Gershwin. He currently serves on various committees surrounding the 2020 SF MoMA City College collaboration with the Pan American Unity Mural. And now I'm gonna hand it over to Mr. Will Menez. Feelies, jazz hands. All right, does everybody see Will's screen? I do. All yeah. right, it's all you, sir. Okay, well, I'm all excited about uh, my City College homie, Ben, uh, his new book's coming out and uh, we're looking forward to that. I'll, I'll certainly tune in for that. Well, this could have been a, a big year for Diego Rivera and Frida Kahlo here in San Francisco. The Mexican consulate even called it the year of Mexico in San Francisco. However, the de Young is still awaiting the opening of Frida Kahlo's uh, appearances can be deceiving, which is already hung. Uh, SF MoMA's Diego Rivera's America, a celebration of the artist's work, which was set to be opening this October, has been rescheduled to the summer of 2022. Yes, 2022. But this mural will be on exhibit at SF MoMA by March of 2021 in about six months, and this is how history happens. We're cruising along expecting something, then a catastrophe happens, uh, a pandemic, great fires, a world war. The Golden Gate International Exposition, the GGIE, was built on this artificially constructed treasure island, and it was meant to celebrate the completion of the two new bridges across the bay. And during the depression, all these projects were to get people back to work. Now the first season of the GGIE in 1939 ended badly. The fair had lost lots of money and its future was in jeopardy because World War II erupted in Europe on September 1st. Now, not being able to sustain a two front war Hitler had signed a very cynical non-aggression pact with Stalin just a week before Germany invaded Poland. 16 days later, Stalin got his chunk of Poland. So much for non-aggression. In San Francisco, this fair marked the end of an era, which had begun with the rebuilding after the 1906 earthquake. With the two new bridges across the bay, and the advent of the Bay as a portal to the Pacific during World War II, the city would never be the same again. Well, there was a lot of money invested in the fair. So late in December of 1939, despite the war, it was decided to have a second abbreviated season. But the European art from the first season, including works by Albrecht Durer, by Da Vinci, and even Botticelli's Venus right here, had all been created up and started a very, very convoluted journey home. Some places, some pieces wouldn't reach home for years. Timothy Pfluger was one of San Francisco's premier architects. Think of 450 Sutter, the uh, medical building with the Neo uh, Mayan motif, a 140 New Montgomery, the art modern Pacific telegraph and uh, telephone and telegraph building right behind SF MoMA. Uh, in 1940, it was the tallest building in San Francisco. Uh, now it's Yelp headquarters. The Paramount Theater, the Castro Theater, the look and feel of the Bay Bridge's western span between San Francisco and 
Treasure Island. And note that all these Fluger creations are in really good shape because somebody cares about them. Well, Tim was also a mission homie. He lived his whole life on Guerrero between 22nd and 23rd Street, just around the corner from where I live right now. And Tim had an idea. He proposed having an art in action program. Artists would work and the public could come and watch. And to anchor this program, Fluger wanted Mexican muralist Diego Rivera. Now Fluger at the time was building the science building out at the new San Francisco Junior College, now City College of San Francisco. And his next project at the college was to be a grand library for which he wanted Rivera to paint a mural. A little background. San Francisco was Diego's first working foray into the US. He was like a door-to-door a -door salesman who needed to get his foot in the door. In 1927, Diego as a delegate had gone to Russia for the 10th anniversary celebration of the revolution. He passed through the US tailed by FBI agents. And through the Freedom of Information Act, I got the heavily redacted FBI files. In New York, the agents approached some others who seemed to be tailing Diego as well. The FBI agents introduced themselves and said, well, who might you be? The answers were all blacked out. When Diego got to the Soviet Union, he was disappointed. They had a different concept of social realism painting. A Diego badmouthed Stalin and was discreetly told one night that maybe he ought to leave town immediately. It was kind of like badmouthing Putin nowadays. Whatever you do, don't order takeout. One thing Diego learned was that the Soviet Union was backwards technologically. Like Marx, Diego believed that the real revolution would happen in a highly developed country like the United States. And certainly once the depression started, it was pretty obvious that capitalism had patently failed and who knew what could happen here. Diego coveted our machines and technologies. A Mexico needed them to reap the benefits of its own revolution. Diego would do business with anyone who could help Mexico get those machines, be it the Fords, the Rockefellers, whomever. Albert Bender started brokering Diego Rivera's easel art in San Francisco in 1926 without taking a commission. St. Albert, as he was affectionately known, grub staked many artists like Ansel Adams. A letter addressed to St. Albert San Francisco was once delivered. Now, when I first started researching Bender, I didn't get it. Here's a guy from Dublin, Ireland, and he's an insurance salesman, and yet reportedly he's tithing 90% of his income to help artists. Well, as I found out later, yes, he was from Dublin, Ireland, naturally the diminutive son of a rabbi. His clients in the insurance world included Levi Strauss and company. He was like a Jewish leprechaun, his pockets always full of presents for his many friends that he might run into on the streets. Now, Bender had heard about Rivetta from sculptor Ralph Stackpole, who had known Rivetta in Paris. So plans began to take shape to get Diego to San Francisco. And on November 10th, 1930, Rivetta and his new bride, Frida Kahlo, arrived in San Francisco by train. They moved into Ralph's studio at 716 Montgomery, which is just spitting distance from the monkey block. On his first visit to San Francisco, Diego Rivetta paint, uh, worked with Timothy Fluger at the Pacific Coast Stock Exchange Lunch Club, now the Private City Club. The allegory of California was a celebration of the riches of our state. Now the central figure was a, the mythical Queen Calafia of the fictional Isle of 
California in an old Spanish novel. San Francisco tennis star Helen Wills served as the model and would have a dalliance with Diego. He was seen riding around the hills of town in the rumble seat of her little green Cadillac. Now that kind of sounds like a corrido or maybe a Beach Boy song. This mural is Rivera's homage to Giotto's St. Francis cycle of painting. And of course, St. Francis is the patron saint of San Francisco. Ralph Stackpole sculpted the colossal male and female statues in front of the stock exchange on Pine Street. They created an agro-industrial paradigm, which Diego embraced for his first two large murals. Right here in the center is Peter Stackpole, Ralph Stun, and he's holding a model airplane. In light of Lindbergh's nonstop solo flight across the Atlantic in 1927, airplanes signified modernity. They signified the future. Five years after this, Peter would become one of the four original photographers for Life magazine. Well, after the stock exchange mural, Diego and Frida took a six week break in Atherton at the home of Mrs. Rosalie Stern. She was the owner of Levi Strauss and Company. She was the widow of Sigmund Stern, as in the Grove, and a dear friend of Albert Bender. Diego painted this small portable fresco, still life with blossoming almond trees. It now resides at Stern Hall at UC Berkeley but it'll be part of S SF MoMA's show. This was Diego's homage to Van Gogh's Blossoming Almond Trees, and it featured Rosalie Stern's grandchildren, her daughter Elise Haas's children. So over here on the left, we have Walter A. Haas Jr., Peter E. Haas, and Rhoda Haas. This little girl on the left, by the way, is Rhoda's imaginary friend, who Diego added at Rhoda's request. Rhoda grew up to be philanthropist, Rhoda Haas Goldman. Lastly, though it was the original project, Diego painted the making of a fresco out at the California School of Fine Arts, which is now the San Francisco Art Institute. This was a project that Diego had needed to get his foot in the door. And some people, you can see Diego's behind up here. Some people have the idea that Diego was mooning the audience, but the theory makes no sense. The direct object of his disrespect would be his friends depicted below him. Early on, there was resentment to an outsider, a foreigner getting such prestigious commissions in a town where artists were going hungry. But soon the artists realized that Diego had energized the local scene to the benefit of all. Eventually he would do this nationally as the model for the WPA's federal art project. Frida's wedding portrait was painted in April of 1931 and it's dedicated to uh, Albert Bender in this little banner up here. He donated it and signature pieces by Rivetta to the fledgling museum he helped found in the mid 1930s. It is what a SF MoMA's prized possession and right now it's hanging in the De Young. Now, though they hadn't yet been married two years, Frida had seen the writing on the wall about Diego's fidelity. In late May, she left San Francisco a couple of weeks early and started her own first affair with photographer Nick Murray. This affair lasted almost a decade. The paint might not yet have fully dried on her wedding portrait. In early 1940, Diego had written four articles for the Mexican tabloid, Oi. He gave a very astute analysis of the world situation. In Mexico, due to this non-aggression pact, the communists were demonstrating and the Nazis were footing the bill. 
At his peril, Diego pointed out how cynical the pact was. Both Stalin and Hitler coveted the same territory. The only question, who was going to throw the sucker punch? Well, the FBI, having translated these articles, thought that Diego might be assassinated. And as Diego predicted, a year and a half later, Hitler invaded Russia. Well, also at his peril, Diego complained that the Mexican Communist Party was run by Stalin, as depicted in this cartoon. Diego wanted an indigenous Mexican Communist Party. So this offer from Pfluger to come to San Francisco again was timely. Here was Rivetta's chance to promote Pan-Americanism, especially in light of Hitler's unstoppable attacks in Europe. Significantly, these two visits to San Francisco are the bookends to all the time Diego spends working in the US. And when he returned to Mexico in 1941, he complained bitterly to Frida about how poorly he was treated there compared to San Francisco. However, <laughs> Diego's life always carom between this high international intrigue down to the telenovela soap opera level. He and Frida had divorced in November 1939 and into the picture came movie star Paulette Goddard, Charlie Chaplin's estranged wife to get her portrait painted. She had met composer George Gershwin in 1937 at a party that actor Edward G. Robinson threw for composer Igor Stravinsky. George fell for her immediately. And we have copies of letters that show that Paulette had that effect on many people. I've even got a letter from Jean Cocteau, who is gay, who gushes about how hot she is. Now, George, in a letter sent the following day, wrote that hostess Gladys Robinson had a pretty good idea about his taste in women because she had seated him next to Paulette. Tragically, George only had four months left to live, but he told Paulette that she should go to Mexico and get her portrait painted by his good friend, Diego Rivera. She went three years later here in 1940. Here's Paulette posing, attended by Diego's bare-breasted model, Nieves Orozco. Now, George Gershwin and, and, and Rivetta had briefly met in 1932 on a privately chartered car on a train going from New York City to Philadelphia for the premiere of Mexican composer Carlos Chavez's symphonic ballet, HP, Horsepower, which was all about Pan-American interaction. Diego had done the sets and costumes. In November of 1935, they were reacquainted when Gershwin went to Mexico after the poor Broadway reception for his opera, Porgy and Bess, the previous month. Now, I've written a play about a real party that was thrown for George and attended by many famous Mexican artists. So in 1940, Diego was publicly slated to marry his model, Nieves Orozco, but she told me that Diego burned all his bridges when Paulette showed up on the scene. But this is how history happens. If Porgy and Best had opened to good reviews, a completely different story would have unfolded. Gershwin might not have moved to the West Coast in a half, and his brain tumor might have been diagnosed sooner. Paulette Goddard wouldn't have gone to Mexico and Diego might have married Nieves. Who knows what might have happened to Frida? Leon Trotsky, the, the founder and leader of the Red Army had lost the fight to succeed uh, Lenin in 1924. And by 1929, he was on the run from Stalin's hitmen. He was kicked out of Turkey, out of France, out of Norway. Nobody wanted to annoy Stalin. In 1937, Rivetta helped Trotsky get asylum in Mexico, and Trotsky and his wife moved into the Casa Azul, Frida's family home, 
and later their own place when he and Diego had a philosophical falling out. Trotsky and Frida also had a flame. Well, while Paulette was visiting in May of 1940, there was an assassination attempt on Trotsky. Mexican muralist David Alfaro Siqueiros led 20 Stalinist hitmen dressed as cops armed with submachine guns. Now, though Trotsky and Rivera had had a falling out, they were functionally still on the same side, which put Diego in jeopardy from the hitmen as well. Diego went into hiding with Paulette bringing him goodies. The inept assassins managed to miss Trotsky, but his grandson told me that as a young boy, he had been injured when he caught a ricochet in his big toe. Well, Paulette helped Diego escape from Mexico, and this is them arriving at the Burbank airport on June 5th, 1940. And it looks like Diego still has visions of a future with Paulette. Diego dramatically told the newspapers that Paulette had saved his life. Well, Diego arrived in San Francisco later that day. And since he had been in hiding, he'd had no opportunity to start designing the mural. This is a photo by Ansel Adams, who was running the photography program out at the GGIE. Now, though the mural was only contractually to be three panels wide, as shown here, in a grandstand move, Diego almost immediately decided to make it five panels wide. Uh, though he didn't realize that at the time, this decision would make it impossible for him to finish the mural during the regular run of the fair. Well, this was Rivetta's first pass at the three panel drawing. And it happened very soon after he arrived. The center icon right here is already there. And the lumberjack sculptor is already there. Well, Dudley Carter, the Canadian lumberjack, timber cruiser, surveyor, and sculptor, was working below Rivetta at Art in Action. Now, Dudley's work must have immediately resonated with Rivetta because it's very evocative of Rivetta's protege, Mexican sculptor Mardonia Magana, who's also a character in our mural. Dudley's work based on indigenous Canadian art would fit the theme of the mural. It was truly American. Like Frida's work, it did not harken back to Europe. The Bighorn Mountain Ram became City College's mascot. Uh, Dudley lived to be 101, but in his 90s, he came back to City College to clean up the Ram, which had been painted red by generations of students. Well, the second step in creating a mural is to research the images required. Mona Hoffman is researching the Aztec goddess Quatlique. She's the mother of all the gods. And she is the left-hand side of the center icon. The other half will be a stamping machine, which uh, Rivetta had previously painted for Edsel Ford at the Detroit Institute of Arts in 1932. Using tracing paper, a one inch to one foot scale drawing is generated and refined with overlapping layers and elements of the mural can be easily repositioned. Finally, using a one foot by one foot grid, a full scale drawing is transferred to the mural uh, substrate in charcoal. And Rivetta would use this as a guideline to paint in a synopia, a reddish painted outline. Uh, you can see this is a Peter Stackpole photo taken for Life magazine. Unfortunately, a large part of Peter's work was lost in the 1991 Oakland firestorm. But luckily some work was on display at the Oakland Museum and was saved. Just seven weeks after arriving, Diego had the scaffolding taken down and unveiled the full-scale Sinopia drawing for the approval of the Board of Education. This finished Sinopia drawing was traced back onto thin paper. 
and further corrections to the work were minimal, but the later addition of his patron, Timothy Pfluger, was essential. You can see it's dedicated to Miss Kidney, where she was a telephone operator at the fair who helped Diego with calls from Frida. This autographed photo was a gift to our archives from her family. Diego would call his mural the marriage of the artistic expression of the North and of the South on this continent. And we call it Pan-American unity for short. Now, Diego had been talking about this concept of Pan-American unity since 1926 and was still invoking it 30 years later in an interview with his daughter Ruth in 1956, the year before he died. However, in latter 1940, it had special importance. Paris, where Diego had lived and worked and studied, fell to the Nazis soon after he arrived in San Francisco. If you read the daily newspapers, there was nothing even slowing down the Nazis. The only question, what would happen after the Nazis had conquered Europe? Now, our country was in an isolationist mode not realizing that in a true world war, there is no place to hide. Henry Ford and Charles Lindbergh, however, were part of the isolationist America firsters, but perhaps their stance had more to do with a fondness for Hitler. Collier's Magazine wrote that the Atlantic was a formidable uh, logistical barrier to the Nazis, but that the US had a 1900 mile undefended border with Mexico. Maybe it was time to take a Mexican to lunch. No one thought to build a wall. Well, the fresco technique is very rigorous and labor intensive, which eliminates the faint of heart. It's almost like the technique has to choose or anoint the artist. First earth ground pigments are prepared and many of the colors are different forms of iron oxides like hematites for reds and oranges. Though they come in powdered form, they must be ground even further in distilled water to a very precise consistency. Lime rich plaster must be prepared and applied in distinct layers, each a finer grain. The last paper thin intonaco layer cut with marble dust is the painting surface. A plasterer puts down only as much plaster as can be painted while it's still moist. If the plaster dries before it's painted, it must be chiseled off and fresh plaster laid down. So the coordination of the plaster and the painter is crucial. But you can see right here the edge of the applied plaster. It's about a quarter of an inch thick. And using the finished drawing, which has been perforated along its outlines, the image is transferred back onto the wet plaster using a charcoal rosin bag. It leaves an outline of dark little dots, many of which are still visible in the mural. But before applying the color to the plaster, Diego first created an undercoat of grays to set the tone. This allowed him, for example, to use one green color and still depict variegated leaves. Now the resulting surface from the reaction of the plaster and the pigment is durable, color fast, and impervious to UV light. Our fresco can last centuries, or as in the case of the fresco murals at Pompeii, millennia. Rivetta started at the top and worked down so that the scaffolding got progressively lower. A very important innovation was the concoction of half butanol, half water, which was applied with this sprayer. Using this concoction, it would keep the plaster wet up to 18 hours. This then became a jornata, one day's work. Each day's work abutting yesterday's work. Last year, 
when world-class art conservators cleaned the mural, they discovered a downside to using this concoction. Sometimes the plaster had already dried, but continued to look wet because of this half butanol, half, half water. However, cleaning the mural made the mural visibly brighter. And these cleaning interventions should never happen more than every 20 years or more. The art and action program was in the Palace of Fine Arts, <laughs> an airplane hangar, now building three out at Treasure Island. The curved entrance right here is still visible out at Treasure Island. The terminal building and the two hangars were gonna be the only permanent buildings at the fair and slated to be the airport after the fair ended. Well, you can see the room layout. The yellow bar at the top is Herman Volt's mosaic murals and the blue bar is Pan American Unity. All the other artists worked on the floor in between. Well, descending his scaffolding, Diego would cross the art and action space to the opposite side and would climb the scaffolding for Herman Volt's mural so he could look back at Pan American Unity from a distance at eye level. Volz's mosaic murals now adorn the north and south portico of Timothy Pfluger's uh, science building at City College. It took an additional two years to finish them. And we have photos of the workers keeping fires going in 55 gallon drums to stay warm. They can get a little chilly out at City College during the summer. Well, this is early on because Carter's still working on the RAM and the Da Vinci bus is still being roughed out. In the upper right-hand corner, you can see Herman Volz's mural. Here's the head of Da Vinci by Frederick Olmsted and it's now at City College against the east side of the science building. He came to campus after the fair and created a like-sized bust of Edison. And then in 1941, he also painted murals in the science building lobby. They depict women and people of color doing science. These guys were pretty uh, future thinking. We restored them in 2002 and they are adjacent to the physics lab where I worked for 33 years. Recently, his mural at the San Francisco Art Institute was uncovered and restored. Well, Dudley Carter finished the RAM rather quickly, but since the fair was still on, Dudley had to start another sculpture. In this aerial view, you can see this big log right here. This will become the goddess of the forest. The log was 24 feet high, seven feet in diameter and weighed 24 tons. Getting into the building required cutting a hole in the wall. Uh, the Discovery Channel aired an Expeditions Unknown episode, which included the goddess of the forest as a clue in a treasure hunt at Golden Gate Park, where the goddess used to reside. The ram and the goddess belonged to City College. Uh, there was a art and action party and we have Ansel Adams, Mona Hoffman, Diego Rivera, and Timothy Fluger. And as you can see, Timothy Fluger came dressed as Rivera, as did Diego. <laughs> Actor Edward G. Robinson, a figure in the mural and a Diego Rivera client came to visit. Robinson had also bought Frida's work as early as 1938 but we found out later he did it only at Diego's insistence. As I mentioned, he had serendipitously hooked up Paulette Goddard and George Gershwin in 1937. That's LA art dealer Sam Saltz on the right and Edward G. Robinson in the middle. Now Saltz was a good friend of Eric Maria Remarque, author of the anti-war novel all quiet on the Western Front. And the film version of this played at the fair just the week after Rivetta arrived. Remark became Paulette Goddard's 
last husband. Well, this is the garden retreat just behind the Palace of Fine Arts on Clipper Cove. And what we have here is Edward G. Robinson, Otto Reno Ronchi, who's the head of the San Francisco Art Commission, Irene Bohas, Rivetta's primary assistant, Timothy Fluger, an unknown person, Dudley Carter, Mona Hoffman, and Diego Rivetta. Now this photo must have been taken in late July, early August of 1940. Now in 2007, I was contacted by Marshall McClellan, Emeritus Chair of the Earth Sciences Department at Eastern Michigan University. He, he told me he'd been looking at our website and seen the figure of the little boy in the mural identified as Donald Karen. Uh, he said that was wrong. It was actually him. He explained, one of the residents at his grandmother Hilda's boarding house on Knob Hill was an artist working with Diego Rivera at the fair. Now, Marshall used to sit and watch this artist paint in his room and the artist had taken Marshall out to the mural. Rivetta had spontaneously asked him to pose for the figure of the boy. Later, Marshall returned for a second session. Well, it turned out that Marshall was the figure in the Sinopia full-scale drawing, but not the model for the full-scale drawing, which is my friend, Donald Karens. Well, Marshall stunned me by confirming that the unknown figure in the center was Johnny Cummings, the artist resident at the boarding house. When the US entered the war, Johnny became a B-29 bombardier and tragically died in the closing days of World War II when his plane crashed on takeoff in Burma. Now, for me, this photo brings Johnny back to life again. Marshall said that Johnny had flaming red hair. He only lived to be 30. Well, when Irene Bohas, the primary assistant, had to leave suddenly, another scandalous story, Emmy Lou Packard took up the position. She had been in New York looking for work because her husband had died in a car crash late in 1939. Now, in 1927, as a 13-year-old, she had met Rivera in Mexico when her father was working as an agronomist for the Mexican government. Diego encouraged her artistic work, but very importantly, in 1940, she became Diego's secretary and chronicled the story of the making of the mural while being a painting assistant. Her son, Donald Karen, the little boy in the mural, years ago shared copies of all the work his mother accumulated for a never written book on Diego Rivera in San Francisco. The original papers are at the Smithsonian Archives of American Art, many digitized, and the rest are at UC Berkeley's Bancroft Library. On August 20th, 1940, Trotsky was assassinated by Ramon Mercader, Stalin's plan B. This is the murder weapon, a piole, an ice climbing ax. Now, Mercader had been trying to infiltrate Trotsky's household and had even dated one of Trotsky's secretaries in Paris. He even approached Frida when she briefly visited Paris in early 1939. Well, since Trotsky had lived in Frida's Casa Azul, she and her sister Christina were arrested by the police for two days of brutal questioning. To complicate matters, the sisters had unwittingly had the assassin over for lunch. Oops. The police, of course, didn't know that Trotsky and Frida had been lovers, but since Frida and Diego were divorced, and since her father was German, the police decided that she wasn't even a Mexican. She was stateless for several days. Now here in San Francisco, 
Rivetta was terrified that she might revert to being a German national who had been passing herself off as a Jew. On August 26, she was hastily naturalized a Mexican. Well, Diego was now packing two pistolas, a 38 and a 45. Emmy Lou Packard left us an anecdote that they'd go out to eat in a diner, but would have to return because he had inadvertently left his pistolas behind. Sometimes he had a guard. Sometimes he slept in a small studio behind the mural. Sometimes at Calhoun Terrace on Telegraph Hill, just at the end of Union Street. And Emmy Lou Packard's mother said that he sometimes stayed in a little bungalow behind their family home on Cragmont in Berkeley. All the while, he was a very large target on the scaffolding, over six feet tall and sometimes weighing as much as 300 pounds, an assassin wouldn't have to be a very good shot. Ironically, for a Mexican and a communist, Diego's natural ally was the US. For all his bombast, Diego was walking the walk in creating our mural. Now he was a target in two countries. Well, a distraught Frida flew to San Francisco in early September, just about 80 years ago now, at the urging of her confidant, Dr. Leo Eloesser. He was the chief of thoracic surgery at Stanford and taught at General Hospital. And if you've been up to the hospital lobby, there's a portrait of him by Frida, which I think is hung at the De Young right now. A book, Querido Doctorcito, Beloved Little Doctor, is about their correspondence. He had organized West Coast doctors and nurses to serve in the Spanish Civil War. An insomniac, he often sailed the bay at night alone. He checked her into St. Luke's Hospital on Valencia Street. She had an infection, but mainly she needed to dry out. Now, Diego had a dilemma. According to his assistant, Mona Hoffman, who had worked with Rivetta in Mexico, recreating the destroyed Rockefeller mural, he was on top of his game painting our mural. So when Frida showed up, he did the only thing a loving ex-husband can do. He got her a boyfriend. Heinz Bergruen was to keep her occupied while Diego finished the mural. Now, Heinz had been working as Rivetta chauffeur and translator, and Diego didn't speak English. So Heinz and he conferred, conversed in French. Now, locally, Heinz was well married to Lillian Zellerbach. Well, after being hospitalized, Frida had to go to New York and Heinz discreetly tagged along. Reportedly, Frida broke his heart. Well, the fair ended on September 29th with the mural only being half finished. Now Diego and the crew had to work without heating in a cavernous hangar out on the bay on Treasure Island. They used a hot plate to keep their hands warm. The lack of heat was a provision for ensuring the world-class treasures for the first season. On November 15th, Paulette came to pose while in town for an appearance at the San Francisco Examiner Ski Show out at the Civic Auditorium. Now, recent analysis of the Giornata have revealed that Diego left a space for her portrait, but had continued to paint the images around it until her arrival. It, it was mainly a publicity stunt because he could have painted her in his dreams with his eyes closed. He had a weakness for Mexican movie stars too. The fairgrounds reopened for the private unveiling of the mural on November 29th, two months after the fair ended. Frida didn't attend because she told Dr. Ella Wesser all the Danes would be there. Days later, it reopened to the general public and reportedly a thousand motorists came. As the examiner put it, the occasion was the preview of Diego Rivera's vast, super colossal and possibly slightly dizzying fresco mural. The article added that it was also 
a silent memorial for the GGIE. Well, Diego and Frida remarried in San Francisco City Hall on his 54th birthday, December 8th, 1940. And knowing them well, Dr. Eloesser brokered their typically unusual prenuptials. Frida, Diego's never going to be monogamous. Diego, you won't be getting any. They both signed on the dotted line. In this second marriage, there could be no infidelity. Fidelity was not part of the deal. Uh, later that day, Diego returned to Treasure Island to do some finishing touches on the mural. But since the plaster had long since dried, the color was applied seco to dry plaster. Emmy Lou Packard left us warning notes since conservation of fresco paint and seco paint are conflicting techniques. In this mural, Diego is promoting a Pan-American union, a marriage. But both partners must bring something to the marriage and Mexico was so poor while the US was still relatively rich even during the depression. Mexico brought thousands of years of its plastic arts, mm -hmm. painting, sculpture, jewelry. City College has an authorized replica of a 14 ton, nine foot high Olmec head. The original was carved 3000 years ago, long before the Europeans arrived. The U.S. would bring its modern mechanistic arts, which Diego admired and which Mexico desperately needed. The symbol of the marriage is this center icon, Cuatlicue and the stamping machine. Now this concept of duality, this necessity of the other, yin yang permeates the mural. The Quetzalcoatl, the plumed serpent, fuses aspects of the sky and the earth. The half skull, half life is another example. And we must remember that with our rights come concomitant responsibilities. Please vote. As Diego left in the last days of 1940, he signed a contract sponsored by his many friends in San Francisco to return and triple the size of the mural. Now, our mural is 22 feet high by 74 feet long. So the resulting mural would have been colossal. Sadly, his patrons, Albert Bender and Timothy Pfluger both died. World War II neatly segued into the Cold War and Diego never saw the mural again. You know, sometimes history's calamities can be measured in square feet, 3,256 feet that never got painted. Well, as we prepare the mural to start at SF MoMA in 2021, soon we'll be extricating the over 20 ton beast from the college's theater, something which would have had to happen anyway since the mural will long outlast the building. The people who installed the mural panels in 1961 didn't understand that. We're paying the price. The talent working on this project is world class. In a nice duality, it's Mexican experts who are furnishing a state-of-the-art technology in the analysis of fresco murals. Some Mexican muralists left in abundance. A Mexican chemist who came with a gun out of Star Trek to analyze the composition of the paint and plaster turned out to be my unknown cousin. Last year, we went to Mexico to confer with our art experts on this very complicated move. This year's visit was canceled by the quarantine. The postgraduate mechanical engineering department at UNAM, the University of Mexico, has been amazing modeling the mural panels in, on a computer and with full scale reproductions hooked to sensors. We've had rocket scientists from Berkeley came out. They are specialists in shock mounting instrumentation to withstand takeoffs. 
We need to get the mural panels over to MoMA as gingerly as possible in the dead of the night. Locally, our mural movers delivered our Olmec head back in 2004, and they move any art piece of any significance in the Bay Area. We'll move the mural to this Roberts Family Gallery on the museum's Howard Street side. Now, Diego would love that this glass uh, face gallery is free to the public. The mural will be on view 24 seven for several years. French artist JR's homage to Rivetta, the Chronicles of San Francisco was at SF MoMA in this very gallery until recently that 120 foot long video collage mural has over 1200 figures in it. This is me right here holding balloons in a reference to Diego Rivetta's Mexico City mural, Dream of a Sunday Afternoon in the Alameda Park. After its SF MoMA stay, the mural will return to City College to a new Diego Rivetta Theater. The architects are designing a venue where you'll be able to see the mural close up and from outside through a glass facade, just like at SF MoMA. For my colleagues and me, stewardship of art and action artifacts is our common goal. We're trying to save as many stories and goodies as we can to pass along to those who follow just like libraries do. Thank you. Thank you, Will. We do have some questions in the Q&A box. Okay, let me open up the Q&A box. Mm -hmm. uh, in, I, I'll read the question. Can you see the questions or? Yeah, go I'll ahead and read them and then answer. I like that. In the studio photo of Paula Goddard sitting, there appears to be two versions of the painting. Do you know anything about his process on the second or the second piece? Yes, uh, the second piece is by Irene Bojas, the, who is going to be the primary assistant. And she was also Diego's lover. So uh, it, was, it, it was a menage cut there. Uh, Paulette. Uh, Nieves and, and, and Irene were all Diego's lovers, so it's kind of a, a little bit of ironic thing. Uh, that other painting by Paulette, uh, the painting of Paulette by Diego will be part of SF MoMA's show. Uh, Diego was married to Frida while seeing Paulette? Uh, no. Diego and Frida divorced in November of, of 39. He doesn't even meet Paulette until the middle of May, 1940. And uh, if there's anything happened between Paulette and, and Diego, it, it was very brief. Mr. Minus, do, by any chance, do you know how many Hispanics were involved in the Pan-American Unity Mural process? Mm -hmm. There wasn't a whole lot. Uh, we have Chinese, we had Japanese, uh, we had a, a, a black woman artist, not a whole lot, certainly not like Detroit. Uh, say something about the Endangered Murals Art Institute, UCSF, uh, George Washington High School. Okay, this is a, a hard time for murals right now. Uh, the UCSF uh, right now uh, UCSF has a $1.8 million offer out there to anybody who can put in a scenario for deinstalling the mural and uh, moving it into storage. The uh, George Washington murals, I think, are still in litigation. Uh, hopefully, we'll find some way. And certainly, we had enough First Nation people have come out in support and uh, people like Maya Angelou have come out in support. Uh, of the murals as uh, depicting a history that's kind of sometimes lost. The Art Institute uh, mural, uh, the Art Institute belongs to UC, uh, the UC system, and they're hoping to find some way of keeping it there. Most of these murals uh, were put on furred out walls, meaning that there's a, 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 the wall of the building 
And then a couple of inches forward from that, they, they make a wall out of lath and plaster on which uh, they paint the mural to allow uh, a breathing space in there. And technically you can take that furred out wall off, but it's not easy and it's hard to do without damaging the mural. And I did say that this mural will be at MoMA at, in March of 2021. It, it's gonna be there in, in anticipation of, of the other show, I mean, the full blown show arriving in the summer and fall of 2022. How many assistants? Uh, oh, <laughs> what is that gorgeous painting behind you? The, the gorgeous painting behind me is by Verity Duroff, my late friend who was uh, an art instructor at City College. City College got some pretty tremendous, you know, we were talking about Ben Baxiera and uh, uh, Verity Duroff. Uh, she passed away a few years back and her husband also taught at City College. Uh, how many assistants worked with Diego on the mural? Uh, I think there's a list on, on the website. I think it could be as many as maybe 15. And, and some of them were just passing through and, and did a, a thing. Very few of the artists got to actually put a paintbrush to the mural. They were all doing grinding paint. So uh, maybe three of, the, the, of his assistants got to, uh, to actually paint some of it. And actually, in the case of two of them, uh, Diego is probably going to fix it when he came back. Is the mural at City College now? If not, where is it? Because of this. <laughs> uh, the mural is still at City College, but it's inaccessible because the guardrails and everything were taken out. Uh, we're hoping to move it in the next couple of months. Um, <laughs> how, how do I interpret uh, Diego and Paulette behind Frida as a, as a Tawana artist? Um, that's Diego just being, uh, being Diego. Uh, the, the thing is, is his and Frida's uh, relationship changes uh, because they have no relations, uh, sexual relations after they remarry. And I found that in Canada in the raw notes for his little autobiography, My Art, My Life. So I always thought it was a nice sentiment, but I didn't realize that it actually happened. They never went back to bed in the last 14 years they were together. Do I think Diego Rivetta is treated unfairly because of his infidelity? Well, Frida kind of bought into a situation. And so because I was in the science building, I came up with a, a metaphor. They are binary stars, uh, stars, a, a pair of stars coupled by a profound gravity, a profound love that compels them to stay together. And obviously the strength of that is greater than the forces pulling them apart. But Diego, I found a letter that Frida wrote in 1940 when she's at St. Luke's Hospital and she's writing to Anita Brenner in New York and she's trying to contemplate getting remarried with Diego and she tells Anita, well, you and I know that Diego has always been the same, meaning unfaithful. And she said, the problem has always been my own damn pride. Frida was at St. Luke's for about a month. Uh, the, the mural is uh, on plaster, it's a fresco, but it's on massive steel frames because it was always meant to be moved from Treasure Island to uh, the new Grand Library, which never got built because of the war. Uh, the, our, our Mexican compatriots at UNAM went and constructed uh, an upper square panel, 14 feet, nine inches square, and a lower half height panel and tested those. Oh, great. Um, how did you first learn about Diego and Frida? Well, I learned about them at City College and, uh, and I took my, I was in the, I was the lab manager in the physics department and used to dealing with data. And all of a sudden I started looking at the primary source material we had and start getting little revelations. And I said, this is fun. And it's kind of like if you like to do crossword puzzles, 
or, or jigsaw puzzles even where all of a sudden you get, you get into a rhythm and stuff starts popping up and uh, every once in a while I jump to the wrong conclusion and I, I'm noticing that in some essays from a, a while back that uh, I'm getting ready to edit so our new docents can use it. How did Diego connect this mural to World War II raging in Europe at the time? We have the movie panel, which is uh, panel four down below where we talk about war and Diego was prescient. He was knowing that once Hitler conquered Europe, he had looked to the Americas and it was imperative that we all be on the same side. And that was the overriding agenda. So he'd do business with anybody. And of course, in this country, we were lagging a little bit behind. And uh, so Rivera was on a mission. His mission was Pan-American unity. U.S. and Mexico got to get together, and there was already a lot, a lot of Nazis here in our country, in Mexico, and not to, not to even to talk about uh, Argentina and Brazil. So, can you please mention the exhibit of on the Mexican consulate? The the Mexican consulate uh, has been uh, sponsoring. Uh, they just renamed their their consulate uh, gallery to Diego and Frida. And unfortunately, uh, they, they have uh, periodic shows there. And unfortunately, all the stuff that was supposed to come to fruition this year, the big stuff at, at MoMA and the Beyond has not happened, but the council is not going anywhere. Uh, can you recommend your favorite book on this topic? Um, I, you know, I like Diego's autobiography because just it's so over the top. Uh, it, it, he's making stories up and, and Diego, you got to understand he's a storyteller and why tell the same story twice? Uh, so he would tell it and of course all his friends would know that he's just making it up and they go, oh Diego, that's a good version of the story. But uh, he was just, uh, he was having a good time. What will the interpretation of the project be at the new site at the history is so rich, I hope there's money to do this the right way. Uh, the, the mural is moving to a place, the rule of thumb is you should be able to get as far away from a work of art as it is wide. And that's always been the problem because he encoded all these dualities that you're meant to see simultaneously. Now, though we can't have a lobby that's 74 feet deep, what we can do is have a glass facade that allows you to see the whole thing from outside and even further away, you can catch a lot of these da da uh, dualities. I think that's all the questions. All right, that was so great. Well, I'm, I, everyone is clapping out there. There's so many great comments in the chat box. And if you did not catch, this will be archived on our YouTube live. By the way, I'm Anissa, I'm your librarian for the day. And I will be sending out some follow-up uh, notes and just a few links. I'll put that link to the autobiography so you can check it out. Yeah, and, and you know, there's a link to uh, uh, put the link to the website where I, I put all the stuff there. there. I got the newsletter there. I have a timeline and the timeline is really great because it gives you an idea of what's happening. You know, like right in the middle of the battle for Britain, John Lennon is born. Amazing. Yeah. We're so knowledgeable. I've been trying to get Will for, I don't know, a thousand years to come to our library and speak. Finally, finally roped him in. Everyone, we want to thank you for today. Will, we extra thank you for being supportive of our library. And folks, I'll be sending out a follow-up. And you can go and watch this on YouTube right now again if you want. Don't go out. If you do, mask up. Will, yeah. we love you. Thank you so much, everybody. All right. There they go. And thank you to the library, too. Thank you, sir. I'll be, I guess I'll have to think of a new project for you now. <laughs> <laughs> I'll continue to stalk you, Will. Don't worry. <laughs> OK. All right, I'm shutting her down. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye. -bye. Bye.